Well, good morning again. At, uh, hi, we're one, one week in. Has anyone pulled a muscle? You're good, right? One week in, what is due? How many of you have already had to turn in written work for something in a week? All right, there you go. Keep that up for 15 weeks and you get to go home. Right, basically, the way it works. Hey, uh, as we really sort of dig in and get started uh, this semester, um, in chapel, we're going to look at some psalms, right? Psalms. If, you know, there are some books that are hard to find in Scripture. If I say, all right, I want you to look up Haggai, you'd be like, all right, it's where the pages are stuck together in my Bible because I haven't quite gotten there. Psalms, you split it in half. Open the book, split it in half, and you're basically in the, in the right zip code. All right, so we're going to look at some psalms uh, this semester. And we're going to do some of them in pretty creative ways, which I think that you're going to come to uh, enjoy. But as we get started, I, my question for you is this. What are your dreams for yourself as the semester gets started? What, what do you hope happens? Great grades. No, for some of you, good grades. I want to be an all-conference all-star on my sports team. I'd like to be the lead in the play. I'd like to get a part in the play. For some of you, it's, boy, this semester, I hope my, I hope my health improves because it's been a long, tough summer. Right? So I'm hoping for better health. The reality is we all want something, right? There's always something on your list. If, if we walk up to you and say, like, hey, what can we do for you today that would make your day better? Odds are, most of you would come up with something. Be like, oh, well, let me think. No, I think I'm all set. Right? We always have needs and desires. And have you ever stopped to think what God would want for us as we dive into the semester? Right? What's God's plan for us? And uh, what's the school year going to look like? What's God's dream for us as individuals and for us as the body of Christ here at Gordon College. Right? Hopefully we'll discover that together as we uh, work our way along. This morning, I'm going to look at the shortest psalm. Right? No need to pull a muscle and go for Psalm 139 early. We're going to go with Psalm 133. The entire psalm, three verses. Three verses, right? So here we go. Now, Psalm 133 is one of the Psalms of Ascent. And the Ascent was three times a year, the Jewish people would head to Jerusalem for a festival. And they would walk up the hills, Jerusalem was in the hills, and they would walk up the hills into the city, and there was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there were the Feast of the Weeks and the Feast of the Tabernacle. And you can read about those in Deuteronomy 16. But it was a psalm of ascent. It was one that often they, they would recite together. They might sing together on their journey to Jerusalem. We're not going to sing it together right now, but we're going to say it together. Ready? Let's, uh, let's read this together. How good and pleasant. All right, wait. We're going to read this together. Ready? Here we go. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. You know, when you read that, you say, you know, it just sounds like a mess. I mean, there's oil running down. It's on, you know, your robe. It's on your beard. It's everywhere. But this psalm really is David trying to describe. The, it starts off not with a question. It starts off with a declaration. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. That's what God wants. That's his desire. And he's declared it good for us to get along and live in unity. Now, that's a real stretch for our nation at the moment, right? Where people argue about whether they got something to argue about, and then they'll argue about that. 
But God's desire is that we live together in unity, that the church be one, that we as Christians lead into each other, that God's people are together. You know, it, it, the people then lived in community, cov- a covenant community. It was, it was tight-knit. It was tight-knit. For a lot of you, when you moved into the dorms at this school, that is the most tight-knit living you've ever experienced. Right? Suddenly you have a roommate. You might have two roommates. And there's a line at the bathroom if you get there at the wrong time. Right? And there's just there's people around. And, and one of the things that might become a desire is I just got to go find some space by myself and get out of the traffic of people. So there's a bit of a challenge there, but God declares how good and how pleasant it is when we live in unity. Then we go on, and it's like, it's like precious oil on the head running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard on the collar of his robes. The oil was the oil of anointing. It was a blessing. It was a blessing, right? The symbolism in this, there's the blessing of the oil of, anoint- of anointment. Um, there is uh, running down on the beard, and for the men, the, you know, having a beard was a sign of blessing. Aaron, one of the leaders, it's like not just any beard, Aaron's beard. It's a blessing. Down onto the collar of his robes and the edges of the robe were signs and remembrances of blessing. Right? The, the Jewish prayer shawl, there would be um, edges to it called zitzits, and they would just often rub them. And so it was like the blessing, not only on the head, it's on the beard, it's on Aaron's beard, it's on the collar of his robe. This is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in you know, it, the Middle East. When I, when I say soil in the Middle East, what do you say? Sand. Right? Dry. Mount Hermon is high enough that there, it provides dew in the surrounding areas. Every morning, the areas around Mount Zion are fertile because of the dew of Mount Zion. So it's like the blessing of Mount Zion making the land around it fertile. And it's as if that blessing was falling out Mount, or from Mount Hermon onto Mount Zion itself, the location of the temple. For there the, God, uh, the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. You see, the... Um, David is trying to describe how good unity is. All right? Have you ever talked to somebody and, and you, people start playing, I'm going to one-up you? Right? You know what I mean by that? Like somebody's saying, like, oh, man, this happened to me. It was really hard. And then their head's going, like, oh, man, I wish I had your easy day because let me tell you how hard my day was. And then someone else joins in and goes, like, oh, your days are easy, right? Can you top this? Can you top this? Right? And, the, and the question is, um, it, it escalates. This is sort of what David is doing here. So we're going to read this psalm in a different way. Right? When I point to you, I want you to say, how good is it? Ready? Now, let's read the psalm. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head. Running down on the beard. Running down on Aaron's beard. Down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Because there the Lord is going to bestow his blessing even life forevermore. It really was like David trying to explain to people, let me try and get your head wrapped around how important this is. This is what God's desire is, that you live in unity, that you be together. And for us today, 
that we would be the church because I believe that unity is God's gift and in many ways is a sacred duty. It is not easy to be united. It is simple to be divided. It is simple, right? Because when you're divided, all that means is I'm living my individual life. I am in my lane. Stay out of my lane. I'm living my life, right? To live united means sometimes I've got to slow down in my lane and invite somebody else to pull in, or I've got to move into theirs. And we surrender part of ourselves to live in unity. Or at least in our minds, we have to make the decision to be united, and God is encouraging us to be a, a united people. You know, I believe that we bring God joy when we work together as believers, as members of the family of God. That's God's desire for us. That's how good it is. You know, as you went to this year, what are your dreams? What are your dreams? One of God's dreams for us is that we be united. What are your dreams? What would you hope to accomplish this year? And the bigger question maybe is, what has God made you to do? What has God made you to do, right? When you're here, most of you are here and you're thinking like, this is what I believe God is calling me to do vocationally. We're all in the same boat when it comes to what is it God calling us to be? Is to be followers of Christ, right? To be united in that. But what is God calling you to do, right? There are people who look at certain things and go like, Man, I got that. And other people look at that and go, like, I am not going there. How many of you love math? Look around. It's good God made people like that. Because the rest of us, how do we do our math? Calc- your phone. What's three plus three? Let me consult my phone. Right? But what, what has God made you to do? You know, our culture has a term for things that you want to do, and sometimes... That's called a bucket list. What, is, what are things that you want to do in your lifetime? Have you thought about that? For a lot of us, it's where we want to be. Right? I'd love to go visit such and such and check it off the list. You know, for some people, they're into cruises, and they're like, I want to go on a cruise during my life. And I'm thinking, me and 7,500 other people locked on a boat is not my idea of a great time. That my wife gets motion sick. The widdits will never be on a cruise. All right, but what are, what are your desires? What is it that you want to do? You know, I, I fly a lot. I, I fly a lot. I, I looked it up, and on American Airlines in my lifetime, I have flown three-quarters of a million miles on American Airlines. I've now flown 700,000 miles on United Airlines. And that doesn't include airlines that are out of business and other, like, you know, other ones my father-in-law was a pilot in World War II, and uh, he always said, there's nothing like the view out of the cockpit of a plane at 20,000 feet. There's nothing like the view of that. You know, uh, one of my good friends, Chris, is a pilot for American Airlines, and one day I was at Logan Airport, and uh, I was there early for my flight, and he was arriving, getting ready for his flight to London. And he was the first person there. So he's like, Bob, come on. Come on my plane. So he's flying a 777, which is, which is a serious chunk of metal to get in the air. Right? New plane. We go down. We get in the, He goes, come on in the cockpit. Sit in the captain's seat. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Right? Then he starts pushing buttons, and the cockpit comes to life. Like, Poof. there are flat screens everywhere. There are no knobs. It's all just pushing screens. And he goes, all right, let me check the weather in London. And the thing is going, I was like in awe. And then, you know, I had to get off his plane because he's going to London. And I had to go back and sit in like 43D on my flight, uh, which was a a real letdown. But I I was always um, fascinated by flying. And then one day, thanks to the generosity of my kids, this happened.
As soon as we, yep, I, I, my kids gave me my first flight lesson, and it was amazing. Right when that ends, as you clear the trees, the gentleman who is the instructor says, the plane is yours. I was like, yes, the plane is mine. And it, we were flying up near me in New Hampshire, like where I, I knew a little landmark, she goes, Go down to North Road and turn right toward the ocean. So we head out toward the ocean. Then he goes, all right, let's go south to Rockport. And we're going down south to Rockport. And we're at like 3,500 feet. Just cruising along. I'm looking down at the people on the beach saying like, yep, this is me up in the plane. I'm usually down there looking up here. All right. We go down. And then the pilot says, all right, we're going to test. Because you're, you're sort of in a fourth dimension when you're in the air. He goes, Keep the plane level. And he takes a piece of paper and he covers the controls. He goes, just watch the horizon and let's see how far up or down we go. So for four minutes, he kept them uh, covered. And we're just cruising along and I was just in all my glory. Then he moves and he goes, we only lost 50 feet. Now he's trying to sell me more lessons, but he's like, you're really good at this. I'm like, thank you. Right? I'm usually back in coach. But, um, you know, it was awesome. There were amazing views. And then when, as we're going along, he goes, all right, this is what I want you to do. When I count to three, you're going to pull back and put the plane into a steep climb. And we're going to stall the plane. Like, he goes, just do it. Okay. You know, you know the plane goes up. And you're going up, and all of a sudden you hear, and the plane loses its aerodynamics, and it starts to do this, and just sort of drop tail first, right? So we're going up, and he goes like, and I, I take, I let go, and then we're coming down, and the plane levels off. He goes, all right, let's do it again. Like, okay, we defied death once, and the plane starts coming down. And as the plane's coming down, he goes, take your hands and feet off everything. And the plane came down and it hit a certain spot and it leveled out. And he told me, this plane wants to fly. This plane was built to fly. And the only reason it's not going to do what it was built to do is if you or I screw it up. Let the plane fly. And that was a great lesson for me because it made me think like, what are we designed to do? What are we, de what is God, how has God designed you? I know how he's designed me and I, I'm still figuring it out. But what has God designed you to do because if God has designed you to do something and he has put his fingerprints on you, the only reason it's not going to happen is the same thing. If you screw it up. Right? You, you, you lean in, lean into what it is that God has for you. You know, God encourages us in 1 Corinthians 12 to be the body of Christ. Right? That is one of God's desires for us. And Gordon is not here by accident. Gordon is not here by accident. You know, and, and the, the fact that we're the body of Christ, there are all kinds of gifts here. Right? When it comes as to what you were designed to do, a lot of that is found in the giftedness that you have, right? Some of you are musicians, some of you are athletes, some of you are artists, some of you are historians. There are those who go to the theater and those who act in the theater. There are students for whom classes are relatively easy, and there are those who will work harder than anyone else in this room to get good grades. There are kinesiologists and linguists. 
There are chefs and those who know how to, law, to mow lawns. There are those who study the mind and those who empty the trash cans. There are international students. There are domestic students. There's faculty and staff. There's administration. There are students. And all together, we are us. We are us. Right? If Gordon was a crockpot, I often tell people, yeah, I work at a crockpot. And that is that, every, you know what, when you make stew, when you make stew, what do you do? You throw the good stuff in the pot and you let it cook. And I, I say, often, I describe us as a crockpot. There are 49 denominations here, last we checked. And the one thing we all have in focus, regardless of our denominations and Christian background, is Jesus. And so, in many ways, we represent the Christian crockpot. Everybody throws their best in the pot and we let it cook. And then we are it. You know, this body of Christ here at Gordon and our being here is not an accident, it's a calling. You know, we're, we provide light in, the, in a pretty dark spiritual land that's called New England. Right? Let's be a light that shines with the light of Christ in, in what we do. Because the world around us is watching. The world is watching. Going, I live near Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and, and there used to be two churches right next to each other. You came into the bend going into the city. Like Everybody coming into the city goes around this bend. And you had Middle Street Baptist Church and then Central Baptist Church right next to each other. Right next to each other. You couldn't avoid them. And even, even myself, I mean, as a pastor, I drive by there and go like, we've got the Baptist and the Baptist right next to each other. Wouldn't it make sense that they put a tent up between them and all get in it? Right? But like, unity. Central Baptist has moved to me. And that's a good thing. They're doing great. But the world watches us. And in our fractured world, if we act as one, if we live as one, that will be a testimony unto itself. A powerful testimony, right? Just for us to, to be a part, to be a part. You want to bring joy to the heart of God and be a blessing to each other, our campus and the region. Then let's, let's do this. Let's do this this year. All right, let's read this again. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head. Running down on the beard. Running down on Aaron's beard down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, where there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. You know how good it is? It's really, really good. So let's do that together, and let's make that part of our call as we, um, as we head into our year. Bring your best. Bring your best.